This is Tony Winyard and episode 7 of Exceeding Expectations. In this week's episode, I talk with Katrina Otter, former UK Wedding Planner of the Year, as we're back in the world of weddings. And Katrina, it's very clear how much she loves weddings and how much she does for her clients. Let's hear more from Katrina. Today, I'm sitting here with Katrina Otter, who is a wedding planner. So how are you doing, Katrina? I'm all right. Thank you very much. So how long have you been a wedding planner? Six years now. Okay. And what got you into it? Um, I was I was working in events in London um, for a very big agency. I loved it. I loved the experience. I loved the place I got to travel to. But it all became a little too much. It was a lot of destination events. So mm. I was spending three months in the Middle East to fly back for two days to go out to America for three months. And it got to the stage where I sort of hit my first season thought. I don't think I could do this traveling anymore. Like it's taking a lot out on me. I met my husband. Um, so it just kind of made sense to, to leave London at that time. Mm. And weddings was something that it was a kind of, it was a natural progression in some ways. And a lot of my friends were getting married at that stage. They were asking me to help them out because I had the wedding planning, um, the event experience. Mm. So it just, just naturally fell into place. Okay. And, and from what, I know about you, you're doing sort of quite high-end weddings, aren't you? So how did that come about from from beginning as a wedding planner? How did you manage to get to that kind of level? Time. All right. So I think it's time, experience, social media. I think as, as you naturally progress as a wedding planner, you do take on bigger budget weddings. So once you prove on your portfolio and on your Instagram feed that you can be, that you can do weddings of a certain size a certain budget Mm -hmm. you tend to kind of get higher and higher but as time has gone on I've put my prices up and I think as I've put my prices up I have attracted clients with higher budgets Mm -hmm. um I know we were talking about it earlier about putting the prices up Mm. and it was one of those things for me it was it was a daunting thing to do to put my prices up but actually putting my prices up meant that I got the bigger budget weddings Mm. I have I have been very fortunate in this year that I've had some incredible weddings Mm -hmm. and I have been blessed with some amazing clients. My biggest budget wedding this year, I have to say, is the loveliest client I've ever had. And so much so that I'm spending New Year's Eve with her this year. And just, you know, her, she was just the loveliest person to work with. But I think no matter what her budget had been, she Mm. would have been the loveliest person to work with. Mm. So... Sometimes it does correlate, sometimes it doesn't. Mm. Um, I find that actually the bigger budget weddings are slightly easier to plan, Mm -hmm. Um, which is a a lot of people might not think that. But for me, it's when when the budgets are bigger, it's easier to spend the money. It's easier to go all out on decor, which is something that I'm, you know, details, design. It's something that I'm really passionate about. Mm. So having a bigger budget means that I can be a little bit more creative. Mm. There are extra areas that I can spend it in, really thinking about the flow of the day and creating that sort of all-round experience for my clients. So what? So I'm, I'm getting you just touched upon something I was about to ask about. What is it you really enjoy about wedding planning? So is it just creating something that it would take? Is it taking the stress away from them, or is it a combination of? I. So obviously, backgrounds is an event. Mm. I love a good spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> I am such a loser, but I really enjoy a good spreadsheet. Right. So um, it's uh, it's delivering something from start to finish. Mm-hmm. So actually, when I left events, I went into a nine to five job, mm-hmm. and i I couldn't cope with it. I couldn't do a nine to five job, and it was one of those jobs where there was no start, middle, finish to a project. Mm-hmm. So I'd, I'd gone from a career where I'd done eight years in events and I had, I delivered project by project. Mm. Whereas then going from this nine to five job, I didn't do that. And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't fathom it. I couldn't put my head around it. I was clock watching the whole time. And then going into weddings, I'm doing something where I'm delivering something. Mm. So I'm, you see something progress 
And it's that sense on the day when you see everything come together. Like, there's no words to explain actually how you feel when you see something mm. that you've worked so hard on. And you see it all come together in one room. You see the client's reaction. You see the guest's reaction. Like, it's just such an amazing sense of achievement mm. to be able to do that. And I think that's what I love most about it is seeing it all come together. And do you have a certain type of client you prefer to work with? Or how does, how does that work? I have a certain style of wedding. Okay. So that's the type of client that I attract. Right. Um, I'd say a lot of my clients are like me in some ways. Okay. So they have similar interests to me. They um, have similar ideas, tastes. So that's the style of client. Okay. Um, but yeah, a lot of my weddings are very classic, laid back, um, country estates. It's more of a kind of weekend wedding celebration style. Mm. Um, I tend not to do things like hotel weddings. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a little bit more sort of laid back, mm-hmm. outdoorsy, yeah. that style. Marquee weddings as well, because I'm based in the countryside. Right. So I do get a lot of inquiries for, for marquee weddings. And so, you know, we spoke before about exceeding expectations, and that's what this whole podcast is about. So how do you... So you, you meet a client and they obviously, they've got a certain number of expectations about things that you're going to do for them. How are you able to exceed those? I, I go above and beyond for my clients. I really do. So it's things like, because I know a lot of them have really busy jobs um, or they're based overseas. I will make sure that I'm available 24-7 for them. So if they want a Skype call at 5am in the morning I will be there at 5am in the morning right. if they want to meet up with me in the evening I'll be there in the evening the weekends I'll work weekends for them mm-hmm. um I am available for them the whole time it's not like I'm suddenly gonna kind of disappear at five o'clock on the dot mm-hmm. um so I think that's one way of doing that it's working around their requirements their preferences um I had one client who um I went to her house every time we had a meeting We'd get in takeaway, we'd sit down, have a whole planning session together, and it used to be just a really fun experience. Mm. But that's the way she liked to work, whereas mm. another client wanted to meet at the RAC in London, mm. um, and it was more kind of process-driven. Mm. So I adapt the way I work according to how my clients want the relationship to be. Some mm. of my clients want it to be a very professional relationship, so I'm being paid to do a service for them, mm-hmm. and that's how I treat the relationship then. Others want me to be an extension of their wedding party, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So yeah. I effectively become their friend that they can confide in. And we have that kind of almost texting relationship. Right. Um, so I adapt the way I work to them. Mm-hmm. Um, little gifts that I send them every so often. Okay. So there's always a welcome gift for them, um, a Christmas <laughs> gift. So and when you say welcome gift, on the day of the wedding, do you mean? Oh. No, so when they book me, I oh, give them a gift. Right. Um, I actually give them a bottle of champagne, which is the champagne that I had when I got married. Okay. So I put that little note about how it's my favourite champagne, etc., etc. Um, I give them a Christmas hamper and then something on their wedding day that reflects what I have learned about them. Mm. So it's always very personal to them and their wedding. Mm-hmm. I did a marquee wedding a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. um, and it was at a beautiful house in Rutland, and the weather was atrocious, so it rained all night, all day, all night, and the marquee was on the slope, and the, uh, the DJ and the bar company, despite me telling them not to, they decided to drive down to the marquee and got stuck. Mm-hmm. so <laughs> this is about two o'clock in the morning with torrential rain they're both stuck had to call the rac rac turned up rac got stuck so the rac had to call another rac van to come and get them out very much is now probably about four thirty-five a.m in the morning i'm still there so this is after the wedding this is after the wedding right okay um and i've been there since 5 a.m so this is now 5am the following day. I'm standing out in the rain. Um, and then RAC turned up to get other RAC. And this is no joke. <laughs> RAC turned up to get the other RAC out. They got stuck. <laughs> so they had to call a third vehicle out 
to get all these vans out. So this now is 8 a.m. in the morning. I have been there for over 24 hours. The owners of the property, so they, it was their niece getting married. The owners of the property came out and they were going for a morning run. And they they got to the marquee and they saw me and they were like, oh, you're back here early. (laughs) And I had to turn around and say, you know what? I haven't been home yet. And I think it was that reaction on their face when they realised that I hadn't gone home. And they, they said to me, I don't understand why you, you didn't go home. It wasn't you that got stuck. Yeah. I said, but yeah, this is, I'm overseeing this. And right. what I didn't want to happen is that you woke up in the morning to find two suppliers still stuck yeah. on your property. And, one, yeah. and I've, I've left. Right. So it's my responsibility to make sure that your, your wedding or your, your niece's wedding is perfect. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, in terms of going above and beyond, I think that was probably That's the one. I didn't get home until 1 p.m. Wow. on the Sunday. And I sat down on the sofa and literally fell asleep within like two minutes on the sofa all afternoon. I was absolutely <laughs> shattered. But at the same time, I wasn't I wasn't gonna walk away from it. Mm. So it's the case of, you know, even though I was I desperately needed sleep, I was so tired, it was mm. still my responsibility to look after that wedding and make sure that there had been, you know, that there, there was a hiccup and that I'd resolved it. I'd mm. stayed to resolve it. And, and do you tend to find when when you're able to give customers surprises, is it often small things or is how, how is it in your experience? Well, it depends. I mean, this, this um, wedding in point, I got a very nice gift from them afterwards. So thank you for staying to sort it out. Um, I'm now doing a party for them mm-hmm. in February and they are soon to be launching as a wedding venue, which I will be co-managing for them. So I think it's those things where I've shown that I, you know, I'm completely dedicated. I will mm. go above and beyond and you get that as a result. Mm. Um, some clients notice it, some don't. Mm. Some, you know, once you've done one thing to go above and beyond, for example, you're meeting up with them on weekends, you're meeting up with them in the evening, they come to expect it, it's a given. Mm. So there's not much you can really do. Mm. They know that you're going to go above and beyond. You say you're going to go above and beyond. You do. And it's, you you potentially aren't going to get the thanks for it because they come to expect it. Mm. Other clients really do so it completely varies between clients because one of the hardest things in a way is because when you're i guess when you're meeting with a client or a prospective client you you want to get the business so you want to say about the different things you can do i mean this is my experience yeah exactly so you're saying about different things but on the other hand i don't want to tell them everything i'm going to do because i want to give them some surprises so so, um can be uh, it's, uh, trying to find a balance, whereas, uh, you know, without telling them too much or without telling them everything. Yeah. And I, I have a lot of clients that are based overseas. Mm-hmm. So it's things like I'll go to the flower market for them and choose their wedding flowers for them, but send them videos, send them images, sort of annotate the whole thing. So it's giving them the full experience without them being there. Mm. Um, but tomorrow, for example, I'm driving down to Devon because I've got some clients that are flying in from the States. And we're doing two jam-packed days of food tastings, cake tasting, uh, meeting with a florist, going to the venue, looking at local accommodation. And bear in mind that, you know, I'll get back Saturday. Mm. And it is it is pretty much Christmas shutdown. But I will do that because mm. it's for my clients. So, of course, I'll do that. So, so from the sounds of things, you, you put so much time into each wedding, so therefore you probably do far fewer weddings per year, I'm guessing. I do, yeah. Right. Yeah. So I do eight a year. Wow, maximum. okay. So really far fewer. Yeah. Wow. But I also find as well that I've done one year where I did 12. Total rookie error. And I, I found it got to the point, now it didn't happen, but I was very dangerously close to losing the plot. But also... I've got to be on top of things. Mm. So if I was to have a certain client call me up and say, oh, how are you getting on with the photographer? And I say, oh, sorry, which wedding is this for? Mm. Or which photographer? Or, oh, sorry, can you remind me what I was doing for you again? But I have to memorise all eight weddings. I have to know every single one, you know, the the location, who all their suppliers are. I have to know all those details. Mm. If I was to be in a meeting with them and they suddenly say, oh, what time's our ceremony? 
Oh, hang on a minute, let me just refer back to my notes. Which mm. which one of the eight are you? So I need to know exactly what's going on. So that's why eight is the right amount for me, mm. because then I can give them a dedicated service. Right. Any more than that, and I just don't think I'd be able to. I've tried it, I've managed it, I didn't have fun doing it. Right. And so because of the time and... and what you deliver on each wedding so I'm guessing you get quite a few like referrals recommendations afterwards because of that yeah so um I have one group and every year I do a wedding for them so they've been since day dot um when you say group how do you mean so it's um they were all in the army together oh I see all all the guys were in the army together so I've done a lot of their weddings so one one every year um so that's a nice little kind of like referral system going on um, but yeah, I do get a lot of referrals. Some people, um, the one that I did this year, um, the, the biggest one that I did this year, they, in their, um, all their wedding stationery, they put my details in there, which was lovely of them. <laughs> so this went out to all 300 of their guests and my contact details were in there as a special thanks to Katrina Rotter. So getting referrals through that side of things. Um, but people coming up to me on the day as well and just asking for business cards and things. Mm. So I do get that. I also write for Coco Wedding Venues and Love My Dress. Okay. So I get a lot of inquiries via, mm. via those um, features as well. That's how a lot of people find me. So I mean, clearly just from hearing the passion in your voice about how you've been talking about weddings, so, you know, clearly you love weddings. So is there... And what is the one, is there one part of the weddings that you really enjoy more than any other? Is it the day itself, I guess, or? Uh, um, the day itself is normally quite stressful. Right. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm one of those people, who, when I get stressed, I have a bigger smile than usual. Um, so I don't relax on a wedding day until guests are seated for dinner. Right. That is the first time when I can properly relax because mm. a lot of the energy, effort, detail goes into the tablescape. So making sure that everything is set up until that point. Mm. I'm normally not enjoying it until that point. And the part when I start to enjoy it is when I see guest reactions when they walk into either the ceremony or the reception. Mm. And that for me is is when I really start to enjoy a wedding day mm. because I can see that everything, all that hard work, it, it's happened, it's there, it's, you know, I've, it, we've achieved it. The client mm. is really happy. The guests are, you know, they're, they're taking photos of everything. For me, that's a job well done. Um, in terms of the part that I enjoy the most, I don't know, really. I haven't really thought about it. Right. But I suppose it is that on the day, that sense of delivering something, mm. working so hard towards something and then being able to deliver it. And do you always stay till the end? Yes. Wow, and that's I think that's unusual, isn't it? That's so many. Yeah, not all planners do. Um, mm. A lot do. Um, some don't. I personally wouldn't want to walk away from anything because I am being paid to be that responsible person to look after a wedding. Mm. And say, for example, cars get stuck in the rain. Who is going to sort it out? Mm. Um, but anything can go wrong. So mm. if you were to consider leaving straight after the first dance, for example... What happens if the power goes in the building? Mm. What happens if a supplier doesn't turn up? What happens if a supplier gets stuck? What happens if they run out of alcohol? What happens, you know, all these what ifs. Mm. Sometimes there are collections that evening. So tableware is being collected. Mm. Who's going to pack that up? Well, that's that's me. Mm. I want to, I mean, I'm also a bit of a control freak. So Mm. I can't walk away from something if it's still going on. Now, the only times where I will is say, for example, I'm working at a venue where you can go on till 4 a.m. in the morning. Now, in all honesty, there's no matter how much caffeine I can consume, I cannot be awake until 4 o'clock in the morning if I've started at 5 o'clock in the morning. Mm. It's physically not possible, um, especially when after about 9 o'clock, for example, you're just watching people dance. Mm. And it's quite hard to stand there from 9 o'clock until 4 o'clock just watching someone dance. Mm. Whereas if you've got lots of things to do, yeah. you can keep yourself going. But once the dancing starts, it's very hard to continue overseeing something. I'll always stay until midnight. Um, I will always stay past midnight if it's a marquee wedding. 
So, for example, if it's going on till two o'clock in the morning, someone has to turn the generator off, for example. And I'm not going to turn around to the bride and groom and say, by the way, you have to turn your own generator off. Sorry about that. Mm-hmm. So I'll always stay until the end for a marquee wedding. If it's in a venue where I know that there's someone responsible from the venue, for example, security who's looking after it, then potentially it might come to the point where it's 1am and it's if the party's still going, that's where I think, okay, you know what? I'm tired now. Mm. I'm not I'm not functioning now. Plus I have to be up at six o'clock the following morning, mm. especially if they're staying overnight, for example. Yeah. So that's the point where I leave. But ninety nine percent of the time I will be there until the end. And going back to the whole kind of over delivering thing. So when you were doing the events before, did you is that where you started to learn about how over delivering pays in you know in terms of getting more referrals and so on? Or? Yes, yes. Um, my first year working in events, I had, um, the boss from hell, um, and she had a military background and, well, she had a military upbringing and her way of working, I mean, it was, it was extreme. She used to tell me that, um, if I hadn't finished at the end of the day, bearing in mind that the end of the day normally was about eight, nine o'clock in the evening. If I hadn't finished what I was doing, I need to stay and potentially even sleep over at work. <laughs> um, I mean, she, she literally, I, I learned everything from her. I hated every single moment of it, but I think in terms of over delivering, that's where mm. it came from is, is from the boss from hell. So it got instilled into you. It yeah. did. Yes. Yeah. But it's paid, paid dividends. It has, it mm. has. And it was only a year. Right. <laughs> I managed to I managed to cope for a year, but I think that's where it, it came from. And in some ways, working in working in a big London company, and there were a lot of us that all started at the same time. So there were about six of us, all of a similar age, that all started at the same time. And the only way to get noticed was over delivering. Mm. Um, they only promoted a certain number of people at a certain time. They gave the best jobs to the people that over delivered, mm. um, and. We, we all were fighting for the same thing. Mm. So I think that got instilled in me just because, you know, I wanted the promotion before everyone else. I wanted certain jobs over other jobs. Mm. So doing that, it instilled it for me from a very, what, from the get-go, from straight out of uni. Wow. So just before we finish, is there anything that you would say about over-delivering like to anyone who's getting into being a wedding planner or even you know, any other line of work? Um. I think the thing is, is that what I've got to remember is that I'm working for myself mm-hmm. and I always set the planning business up with the intention that I was going to succeed. And I didn't want to kind of, I wanted to put my all into it I, and putting my all in means over delivering mm. because what I don't want to do is invest in a new website and say that I'm going to become a wedding planner and then just expect inquiries to come in, mm. just expect that someone's going to find me and book me without putting any effort into it. Mm. And I think I've gotten a lot further, a lot quicker because I have over delivered. Mm. Um, so it's not expecting things to come through, but working for yourself, you do have to over deliver. You do have to be flexible. You're working in the wedding industry. So you do have to expect to work mm. weekends, evenings. I hear a lot of people saying, Oh, I'm going to change career because I want more of a work life balance. Well, you know what, work-life balance doesn't exist in the wedding industry. As much as everyone wants it to, mm-hmm. there is no such thing as a work-life balance. Um, so I will have days where I have to work until midnight, I'll have to be in at 4am, I'll have to work weekends. Mm. I mean, But weddings are at weekends, so of course you're going to have to work weekends. Mm. So it's, yeah, I personally have got a lot further, a lot quicker, because mm. I have over-delivered. Mm. So... I would recommend it. I am knackered as a result. <laughs> I am absolutely shattered. I am really looking forward to Christmas, but it has been worth it. And I get the impression you wouldn't do anything else? Or... I, I, love, I love weddings. I love, I love planning. I think that's what it is. So it's, it's what I'm good at. I write lists for everything. Right. There are lists at home, there are lists in my office, there are lists in my car, there's lists everywhere. Right. Um, so it's something that I, I know that I've always been good at and wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So I can't imagine doing anything else. Now, I do do style shoots 
once again, it's in the wedding world. Um, and I train other wedding planners. So mm. once again, in terms of weddings, so it's, it is all, you know, it's all I do. Mm. But yeah, I can't imagine doing anything else. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, Kat. Well, thank you very much for coming in. And um, yeah, I'll meet you again sometime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next week on episode eight takes us to just outside Chicago with Brendan Hufford, an expert on SEO who may well surprise you on ways to get better results for your website. Thank you for listening today and uh, please do subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. And do remember, get in touch if you know of someone who you feel would make an excellent guest for this show. I look forward to speaking to you soon.